<laughs> so I came in through recovery. Uh, whatever I came into, <coughs> uh, recovery, Stolman recovery. You know, when I came into recovery, I had no idea what the problem was. Um, I thought it was you, basically, or the cops, <laughs> or the judge. You know, people with authority were the problem. And uh, of course, there's no solution if you can't identify the problem. Really, you know, it's just. Uh, so I came in and uh, they pointed it out to to me that the, their take on it was the root of the problem is obsession with self, you know, the small s. And so when I look back on my life from that point of view, it made a lot of sense. And one of the main things I remembered, I remember I was 11 years old and I was walking through the hallway at school one day and a pretty girl said hello to me. And I went home and wondered what she meant by it for about five hours. Yeah. But the only way I could entertain it is how it pertained to me. I only could see it from the point of view of self. Yeah. I went over every possibility that I could come up with. Does she like me? Doesn't she like me? Ah, just ah, nausea. And uh, that's the obsession with self. Yeah. Now, over time in recovery, I was led to sort of uh, entertain that there may be there may be something let's say prior to the obsession of self. I would say it's called identification as the self. Yeah? Now it's not identification as which is the verb and the self which is the noun. It's I it's identification as a self. If that's a whole verb. From where I'm looking, there is no noun called the self. There's just selfing. Yeah. So this activity of the mental process which basically is insinuating, implying, pointing at, inferring that there's a someone there. So let's say when there's an action done, you feel like you are the actor. Yeah. When there's hearing, you feel you're the hearer. When there's seeing, you're the seer. When there's feeling, you're the feeler. When there's tasting, you're the taster. Yes? That's called the bondage of self to me. So let's say some people go, as well, is self the ego? Well, in my view, it's not really the ego because... The feeling of having a self, of having an ego, is the sense of self. Yeah? yeah? The feeling of being the one who has an ego, or the one who used to have an ego and doesn't have an ego, the bondage isn't at the ego level, it's at the self level. It's the feeling that comes about through the interpretation of conscious contact. So conscious contact is what's happening today. Yeah? There's seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, and touching. Consciousness is moving through five gates. They're called the sense gates. And then there's a mind. The mind in Buddhism is called the sixth sense, where you're, seeing, you're hearing thoughts like you would hear a note. Yeah? The mind. So the mind is sensing thoughts, and then there's the seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, touching, and that comprises conscious contact. That's the basis of every moment you're awake in a day, is there's conscious contact. Yes. Now, the, there's a mental process that comes after the conscious contact because it is, it is of time, because it's a process. When you and I were born, there was no sense of self. Yeah? The baby, or not even the baby, that's what it's identified as, the mind that was in that situation grew into the sense of self. Usually they start, say it starts around the 18-month mark. And it sort of, in some research says, it's funny, it coincides with the language center going off. And you, if you see the rest of your life, the language center is supporting the idea of being the subject, of being the self. Yeah, it's like I was, we, I said it yesterday when I came here. I used to have short hair, so my hair's been growing. So people say you're growing your hair, like it's something I'm doing. I'm just not cutting the hair. The hair grows on its own. I don't take a few hours a day, you know, in my week to grow my hair. You know, I got to go to the hair growing space and I grow my hair. No, I just don't cut it. Yeah. But the language assumes that the we're the doer in insane ways. Yeah. So you're walking around. There's a very slight. You're not digesting your food, are you? I mean, you had lunch today, yes? Are you digesting it? Did you have to spend some time digesting the burrito? Because if you did, you would have forgotten one or two of those things, that pizza or that burrito. You'd have a backlog. You'd have to go on a retreat just to digest, like a digestive retreat. Everyone would have to go stop all your activities and just digest your food. Obviously, you're not digesting the food. Yeah? But then there's a subtler process that's happening in the brain body system, which is thinking, but you believe you're the thinker.
you know it's obvious you're not pumping your blood, beating your heart, but it's not obvious to a lot of us that we're not the thinker. There's a belief that we're the thinker and we're definitely the object of thoughts. Yeah, That's the bondage of self. The bondage is not thoughts, it's the my thought. Yeah, It's the one, the seemingly, the seeming one that is the thinker or has the thoughts. Yes? It's the seeming one that's feeling is the dilemma, not the feelings. Yeah? People want to change their feelings, but they don't want to change the feeler. Yeah? They want to have all good circumstances, but maybe why you're having so many problems is that you are, you are the problem. Yeah? And you're just lending your own condition onto other situations. I mean, how many problems have you had in your life? And there's only been one you that had them all. Yeah? I would look at that you. Maybe that's the source of your problems. (laughs) I would. Why not? If you have 40 things to look at, and one thing that's in relation to all those 40 things, why not look at that one? That may be giving everything else the meaning it has. Yeah? And I found it to be true. And then there's relief. Not from your problems, from the, from the one who has the problems. Yeah. There's the greatest relief. Because problems come and go, but the one who has the problems seems, seems to stick. That's the one that, that's, that's shouting out that it's a continual event. That you, you were there, you will be there, therefore you are here now. Yeah? I was sharing last night, but there's a lot of new people. The sense of self is produced. It, it didn't come naturally. You grew into it. Yeah. You grew into it. And it has a very very good strategy to prohibit you from growing out of it. Because when you try to grow out of it, you're going to grow out of it as a self. Yeah. So you're going to try to be... You want to be here to have an experience of your own absence. It's not going to happen. See? Self can't get out of self. Yeah. If self tries to get out of self, that's being in self. <laughs> if you study about self for two years, that could be construed as obsession with self. Yeah, you're thinking that knowledge is going to prevent, is going to produce some effect, but it's not going to lead you from freedom from self. In AA, we call it. You'll have self knowledge, and that self knowledge will avail you nothing. It's like becoming a professor of holes but it's not stopping you from falling into any holes. What's the point of that knowledge? If it's not preventing you falling into holes. I don't want to know everything about holes and keep falling in them. I want it to prevent me from falling into the next hole. So this idea of self can't get out of self is the incredible strategy of this system of thought and interpretation. It convinces the mind that it's that. Yeah, And so when the mind gets really irritable wrestles and discontent by its effects and it tries to escape it tries to escape as the basic fact of the dilemma yeah just like in there's an old Zen master called Huang Po famous old Chinese Zen master one of my favorite you won't get a chance the teachings of Huang Po is a great great book the teachings of Huang Po he says you can't use mind to find mind yeah You can't use the Buddha to find the Buddha. You can't use light to find light. That's what we're attempting to do. When we're identified as self, we have forgotten the Buddha nature. We've forgotten the light. We've forgotten the raw mind. And we're attempting to use, let's say, a bastardized version to try to find the real thing. Which is impossible. All you need to do is question the bastardized version. Is that you? If it's not you, you may find out that you are light, that you are mind, that you are the Buddha. Like Ramana says a beautiful statement, a master called Ramana Maharshi, he says, to know God is to be God. What happens with most of us? To know God is to become a knower of God. Yeah? The emphasis is always on us. God is now an object that, that reflects the greatness of, of us by knowing it. Yeah? But he says to know God is to be God. Very fast. Yeah? Very, it takes no process, no time. It's from as soon as you know, and for me it's more knowing what you're not is being what you are. Yeah? You don't need to try to know what you are because you can't, but you can know what you're not. Yeah? 
because you're not that. So there's, you can see it from what you are. And from that position of what you are, you're seeing what you're not. Yeah. So the knowledge about what you're not is exactly that. It's like there's a great old, another great master, Dogen, said, to study Buddhism is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. Yeah. To forget it. To study it is to forget it, not to learn more about it. You learn to a certain point where it has done the job, where you lose interest in it. And why do you lose interest in it? It's not you. It's as simple as that. If it's not you, you're going to lose interest in it. If it's you, it's going to be very difficult to lose interest in it. Your attempts to lose interest in it is interest in it. Yeah? But if it's not you, you lose interest in it. So like St. Francis says, forgetting the self, and then you're reborn. It's in self-forgetting that all this stuff will happen. Yes? There's other guys saying, it's about forgetting the self. Yeah? Why is it about forgetting the self? Because the self can only be remembered. Yeah? It is not so. It's not, rele- it's not relevant right now. In this moment of conscious contact, it's an afterthought. Yeah? right here but in time and by the thought system you can picture yourself the system of thought pictures you as a body somewhere else at other at a, some other time and in that remembering you yeah so it thinks about you then and remembers you now it thinks about you in the future but it's using that thinking about you in the future you may call worry or anxiety but it's there to you remember you now yeah and you can remember you now where you can actually actualize mythical effects from a point of that's not happening and you will feel the effects of that not happening now as a self. Yeah? The self will be the reason. The self will be the, act, the activator of that experience. Yeah? And the only, the only reason why your interest will go that far down those wind tunnels of past and future is it's about you. Just like if someone, if you came over my house and you were talking about the fears you have about what's not happening, would that be able to jump into me? It's not happening. I could sit right next to you, right where the storm seems to be going on, and I wouldn't get wet. It would have no effect on me. And why? Because I had a basic immunity. They're yours. I have nothing to do with it. That's exactly the same idea turned on your own head. And yet, if someone comes over my house like you and does that, I'm bored in two minutes. <laughs> Jesus Christ. You know, I'll do anything. Laundry, I'll go to a movie with you just to shut you up. <laughs> but me, I've been listening to the same thought system, but it's crowned as mine or about me, and it's incredibly entrancing. So you can't say it's the thought system. It's the my of it. Yeah? It's, it's about me. That's what it, that's what entrances your mind. That's why they call it in Buddhism. They call it cherishing the self. Word cherishing is quite good because you're loving it in a way. Yeah. You may talk about I'd like to get relief from it, but you want re- relief as it. You don't want relief from it. Relief from it is too much of a threat to it. You'll take relief as it. You may even want to be free as that, but you will never be free. The only real freedom that stabilizes is from it. Yeah. So it takes these feelings that are incredibly natural, these learning, these yearnings and longings, and it bastardizes them. And so now you're trying, you're yearning for freedom, but you're encapsulated as a self. Yeah. So of course the only way you can entertain freedom is at a future point based on you doing and having yourself into a position where you can get the freedom. When you are the freedom. Inherently, right now. Yeah. Peace of mind is a part of mind. It's available. The point is, can you enjoy it? It's not about peace of mind. It's there. But can you enjoy peace of mind? That's the trick. Yeah. How can someone totally, somebody who's taken themselves to be a someone, who's totally immersed in time, truly have peace when its thought system is worrying, will the peace be there tomorrow? Yeah? And especially if the piece has been told a story about that you did something to achieve it, you're definitely going to believe you can do something to lose it. How can you have peace then? Yeah, It's a commodity. 
you got you can't build a fence around it. You can't privatize it. You can't start selling stock in it. Yeah, it's going to provoke provoke so much fear just because you believe there's a tomorrow, and peace may not be there. Yeah, I got to I got to rush into that tomorrow. Screw peace. I, I want a future peace. <laughs> I'm willing to give up the peace now to have a to have this mythical problem promise that I will be at peace later. <laughs> what a bad deal. <laughs> I'll give up this, which is all there is, for some freaking mental idea about how it's gonna be when I arrive. How many arrivals have you arrived at? And you immediately the sign just changes and now it's departure. <laughs> Departing to the next arrival. It just goes on and on and on. If you had frequent fire miles where you're seeking, you'd be traveling free the rest of your life. <laughs> for all the seeking, you would have freaking car plots, you could buy motorcycles and everything with all those miles. You could be trading on you'd be going everywhere. You know what I mean? You're always you're just trucking, just moving on constantly. Driven like a form of slavery. By a thought system. And it's not by the thought system. That's what's being used. It's by the identification with the thought system. That's what initiates it. That's what fuels it. That's what allows it to seem like Technicolor. I'm telling you, the movie isn't that good. It's the audience. It's the mind. The mind watching the selfie. The mind listening to selfie is what produces this incredible production. Not the thoughts. The thoughts are just vehicles. It's the my that is the bridge that downloads the thoughts, downloads the information the thoughts are going to contain. Yeah, you're going to make that thought everything it freaking is, just like you give everything all the meaning it has. Yeah, and you can cut off the distribution line by just seeing if it's the my. The difference between if you put here like we did last night, money, sex, health. Everyone would give it a meaning, yeah? Money, sex, and hell. Now change, you want to change the weight of it with one little word? Put my money. Much heavier. My money is a lot heavier than money. <laughs> my sex is definitely a lot more important than sex. And my health is freaking all-consuming, it could be. Yeah? Just the mind. Now do it with problem, my problem, life, my life, time, my time. Thoughts, my thoughts, feeling, my feelings, careers, my career, girlfriend, my girlfriend. Let's say you have some tendencies, and everything's just a possibility of, let's say, jealousy and stuff, yeah? And you're going out with a very nice girl or a guy, and you're having a great time. And then one day, you christen her your girlfriend. Yeah? Now she's called my girlfriend. And then suddenly, you feel like you have the right to break into her emails and check out what my girlfriend is doing, and then you're stalking her and all like this stuff. You know what I mean? Because now it's, everything's changed. With the girlfriend, it was fine, but the my girlfriend is different. It's sort of an ownership comes over it. Yes? I deserve to have carte blanche surveillance on my girlfriend. This is what happens with this simple mind. It's the simplest word to extract. It would change your whole life. Seriously. Not your whole life, but day to day, which is your whole life. You would travel lighter. Yeah? And that's basically what's going on here. You're gonna travel, that's it, as a body. As this body or in this body or or through this body, this is the vehicle. And this is of time. Yeah, you've got a limited amount, but you're gonna be traveling. Yeah? Day to day, this and that, that and this. There's options. You can either be traveling really heavy or lighter. And there's degrees. Yeah? You can play with all the degrees, but basically it's either heavy or light. Yeah? Let's say in one sense you're dying as the self, you know, which you're devoted to the thought system, you believe you're that, which it's implying, inferring. You're basically going to be traveling heavy, that dying as the self. Dying to the self, where you have an immunity to the thought system, you see all the pointing, but you're not making the leap into what was what's being pointed at, which is the feeling of being a self. The selfing cannot produce the self. The mind does the rest. It just implies, infers, insinuates, reinforces the implying, the inferring, the insinuation, and then the mind makes the leap into the feeling, I'm the doer, I'm the haver, I'm separate, yes, I'm long-lasting, I'm independent, yeah. No one can understand me because they're not me. There's only one me and all these yous. 
even though all these you see me as a you, I beg to differ with all you and I call it me. Yeah. <laughs> even though I can be seen just like your body can be seen, I think this body is a different body. It's me. Yeah. <laughs> None of you yous can help me because I'm a me. <laughs> I know you're going through shit, but not, I don't. I don't deserve it. This is me. <laughs> That's when I got arrested. I always was wondering how they were seeing me because obviously they weren't seeing me. They were seeing this drugged out junkie, you. <laughs> you know. And I'm, but you know, don't you understand who I am? They go, yeah, we exactly know who you are. You're a junkie. No, it's me. <laughs> I'm different. I am. No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we had talked the other day I was at a meeting and they were talking about fear as the big uh, activator of defects of character Yep. so if you watch it fear is the petri dish and then it activates defects of character Right? defects of character activate decisions and behaviors those behaviors activate consequences yes? And then usually the consequences scare the bejesus out of you. They don't seem to work out well. And you make another decision based on fear, which activates, and so on and so forth. just goes on like a loop. And of course, if this loop is, in, is set, you want relief from it. And you have to do anything. Get loaded, even though you know it's a crazy idea. Do all this stuff. It doesn't matter. The relief becomes the imperative. But I'm saying fear isn't the cause, really. Fear, fear is an effect of the real, in another cause called the uh, reliance on self. Yeah. Reliance on self is producing the fear, which is activating the defects of character, and so on and so forth. Yeah? If you want relief from this, the fear, which therefore you'd get relief from the other, would be looking here. And how, what is the highest level of reliance would be become identified as the self thing you're relying on? And that's what the mind has done. It's been relying on a system of thought called self-centeredness to such an extreme, it's way past obsession, it's identification as. It's forgotten its own nature by constantly remembering this false nature. It's actively denying what it is by constantly remembering what it isn't. And it has to be remembered because it isn't so. The only way something that isn't so can appear is to be remembered, obviously. Yeah? Last week isn't so. It can't appear today. There's no room in this Saturday for last Saturday. Yeah? But I can remember it. And in a sense, its effects can appear now. Yeah? That's the power of our mind. So let's say if something isn't so, it's truly never going to be so. It never was so. And it never will be so. But in this situation, it can appear to be so. To the mind. Yeah? So how does it appear to be so? Well, it has to be remembered. So obviously, the thought system pictures you as a body. When you think about you three years ago, you're pictured as a body. Yeah? If the, you go, say, I was in, let's say I was in California three years ago, you're not seeing you as space, like hovering around California. You're picturing you as a body. Yeah? So the thought system sees you as a body. That's how it presents you. I'm telling you, it does. And it doesn't value this moment, it values the past and the future, obviously. Just look at a 20-minute segment of your thought system and you can tell its principles. Its principles is there and then are much more important than now. Yeah. Why is that? Because now there is no proof of a self. But in time, there is a proof of the self. You can picture yourself three years ago as a body, and you have, maybe you have pictures of, of being in Hawaii and everything like that, and it proves, in a sense, that you were there. Yeah? And then you can worry about yourself, and you're picturing yourself in the future, and in that remembrance, you will be there. Yeah. Or you would feel so stupid spending all this time worrying about a stranger, really. <laughs> so it's you that was there. Yeah? So I was there. I will be there. I am here. That's what it does. So you're remembered. That's the best it can come up with. And the highest level you can reach is appearance. You cannot exist as a self. Because there isn't one. But you can appear to be one to you. Yeah? That's what happened. And to the other yous that are invested in a me. Yeah? Just like when I was young, when I was nine years old, 
one of my favorite uncles passed away, and uh, when he was, we'd be at those relative parties, he'd be the guy that slipped a dollar behind his back, and you'd come by and grab it, you know. He wasn't supposed to be giving you money, but he gave you money. So, of course, you were affiliated with him. Yeah, so I love Uncle Fred. He's paying me off. You know? So, he passed away, and my mother took me to the funeral. It was like a casket, you know, in a wake. And she wanted me to go up and say my goodbyes to Uncle Fred. So, I, you know, I wasn't that wild about the idea, but she brought me up to the casket. And when I looked in, I had a sudden hit that that wasn't Uncle Fred, you know. It was dead and dirt. And what I was, I was thinking that was Uncle Fred, and in hindsight I realized because I was thinking this is Paul. So I was just projecting the same identification I had with spirit as a body onto him. But when the seeming spirit, or whatever you want to call it, the prime or life force, whatever, had left or wasn't facilitating the activity of that body, it was obvious that body was never Uncle Fred. I was misnaming Uncle Fred. It was really that spirit. Because now that was gone, it was obvious that wasn't what Uncle Fred was. You know? And you could take, let's say Uncle Fred didn't get hurt up here, you could take an eye out of Uncle Fred's head and put it in a live body, and it would facilitate seeing. But it was never the eye that was seeing. It's never been the ear that's hearing. It facilitates hearing. It needs consciousness for hearing. It needs consciousness for seeing. You need consciousness for feeling. You have the equipment to, con to uh, be a conduit of that experience or a facilitator, but it's not the doer of the, f of the, of the event. The uh, doer is consciousness, yeah? Yeah. So this is what happens. You see, so this idea of whatever I, I'm taking, when I take myself to be this, I'm going to take you to be that. Yeah, But I'm going to always keep you distant from me as a you. And this one, one you, this one special you, will be crowned with me. And I'll be the only me in the whole world. No other me of there. I'll never call anyone else me. Except this, yeah? How special can you get? Yeah? It's called playing God, you know, like the cell thing. And once it takes over, it plays with your godlike juice. It sure does, man. It will make things seem to be real. It will make false evidence appear real to you, which is an acronym for fear. False evidence can never be real, obviously, but it can appear real to you. That's the role we play. We play a huge role here. Some people think they're a victim or they're, it's very passive. It's a very active engagement. We're the dreaming of this place. The dreaming of this place is happening right now. Everyone here is in what we call a singular event, but having it is having a different experience because it's a subjective view you're having. Yeah? It, it, it filters everything in a different way than everyone else. Yeah? So everyone's having a different experience of the same event based on this subjectivity. Not the subject, but the subjectivity. Yeah? So you and I, in a sense, are giving everything all the meaning it has. You and I are giving everything all the meaning it has. And what's most of us is what's happening is what's giving the meaning to our lives is a system of thought called self centeredness, yeah? Which is aptly defined by the statement self centered. So it's centered on self. And the thought system is there to reinforce that self, yeah? By the constantly inferring and referring back to it through the language. You're always referred to as being the doer when you had nothing to do with anything at times, yeah? Somehow you always seem to have a role. You're always written into every situation, yeah? But in fact, if you really, if you really see, life is just happening. And then you'll see the selfing wants to do this. Life is happening to me. It wants to suck it in and have it surround and orbit around you. And in a sense, that's what produces the incredible contraction and all the neuroses in your life. It's just way too much juice being centered on this mythical mental point. It's like, put, it's like looking at a, a bug and then the, uh, the magnification is catching the sun and you're actually burning the bug while you're looking at it. Well, this constantly have everything, this, we're living in this self-important loop. Everything is coming, returning back to here. So my attention goes out, runs into you, yeah? And then there's an experience, and it comes back and it runs into this. Yeah? So there's this loop. The thing is, what would happen is, if you're not that, if it didn't stop here, what would happen? Your attention would keep going. And you realize it's a huge circle. Yeah? 
And what really enriches your life is when it goes into nothingness and then participates in here and runs into all these things, but it doesn't go back to a thing. It goes back to no thing. Yeah? That this is just, this is like a relay on the line. It ain't the station. Yeah? It goes through and then goes back. And this is what gives you a sense of well-being. You sense a presence because now it's broken out of the loop of self-importance and it's going all the way and just going into nothingness and bringing some of that back to influence the experience of thingness, which is what allows you to travel lighter. You're not going to travel lighter in thingness with another thing. You need the, you need the presence of nothingness to lighten or leaven the situation in thingness. Thingness will just get you really fucking heavy after a while. Yeah? We need a lightning agent, a lightning, something to leaven the situation. And that's what this is. So it's going to go in this direction, but it usually hits the little smiley face of you, and then and it, then it goes, all right, that's me, and then it bounces back out to explore and bring all this back to the me. But it isn't this. It's more of the nature of nothingness, and it will respond in kind when it reaches more what it's like. Attention is of nothingness. It's not of a thing. You do not have attention. It's not your commodity. It's how much... Do you ever run out of attention? Did you spend too much attention Monday through Wednesday and now you're bereft for the next four days? You've got to shut it down? Just sit there comatose until you gather your points of attention again? You get your Monday shipment? I better be wiser how I spend my attention. No. There's an infinite amount of attention, isn't there? There's an infinite amount of interest. It can go anywhere. But if is it of a thing... Or is, a, or is this quality more like nothingness? Why do you think what would happen if attention moved and went through this thingness, this billboard called you, and go to where what really it is, which is the consciousness, or you want to call it the awareness, it's going to recognize that as home. And you know what? It's going to rest there. And it has plenty enough to do with to deal with whatever comes up in a day. Yet now, instead of the thing that's usually causing your obsession with self, it will be enriching your life by, a, it's called abidance and truth. It's the same energy. It's just what vehicle it's resting on. Yeah? If it's resting here, it just produces this neuroses. Everything's about me, on and on, and it's unbearable. So it tries to break out and get relief from the original addiction, which is the mind's addiction to self. And then it spawns alcoholism, you know, freaking drug addiction, pornography, shopaholism, alcoholism. Yeah. It just morphs in because, really, the other addictions are just the mind's ignorant search to get relief from the first addiction. The addiction to self. What would happen if you dealt with that and was told the truth that I'm not that which the mind is addicted to? The, the loss of interest would be amazing because the key is that it believes it's about it. Yeah. It's just such a simple example. I'm interested in someone. I'm giving a woman a lot of meaning. I'd like to meet her. Yeah. She's in a room next door to this room. She's at another meeting and I'm here. But I'm really trying to listen in to this meeting to see if she says something about me. So maybe if she says, oh, I like that guy, Paul, so I, you know, that's an in, I can go and talk to her. Hey, why don't you have some coffee? Let's talk about spiritual stuff. You know? I'll even give you a massage. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, like that. so I'm there, you know, and I'm supposed to be doing a talk, and people start noticing I don't seem to be here, you know. And they go, Paul, you're supposed to be at this talk, and I agree with them. But I can't seem to call the attention back. First of all, it's not mine, you know what I mean? It has, it has a different directive. It's been run by selfing right now. So it's out there trying to hear, you know, like use super x-ray hearing, you know, hear what she's saying. And then someone sees it and runs up and throws a book on the table, you know, how to lose interest in a conversation in another room. And I page through it. I liked its principles, but it's not, it's not working. I throw the book down. And suddenly I hear her, and I'm really keen. And she's talking about a guy named Matt. And my name is Paul. What happens? I lose interest immediately in that conversation. I don't have to take a three-month retreat on how to lose interest. Yeah? It just goes through. Where does it go? Find out. But it's going to leave that thing. Yeah? It's going to leave that thing. And it's going to come somewhere. I would say it's going to boomerang right where it's always been. Right here. 
And then now, if it's here and it's being spent here, it's going to enrich your life. Yeah, you're you're delaying its effect by hoping that person will enrich your life later. But this attention and interest, being right where you are right now, will enrich your life right now. That's the deal. You want to believe this mental salesman and buy these waylay plans? You know this delayed gratification, like forever. Or do you want to have an ease and comfort now? Do you want to be aware of being aware? Yeah. How are you? What is aware of the conscious contact? Yeah. That's another aspect of mind that's even beyond consciousness. You are that. So the way I saw it work for me was, I came to a meeting like this, Someone informed me of something like this. I think they said it in a much nicer, gentler way. And they, you know, made it very loving and stuff. And I saw that. I liked it. I didn't even really hear what they said, but I liked the space. And then uh, I went back and I heard another person talk about it. And in that, at that event, it hit me like an unspoken yes. Like it was prior to knowing. I just knew. Yeah? Like Ramana explains it like your head is in the tiger's mouth. It's already a done deal. So this happened to me, and then I just explored a little more, read more books, went to different meetings, liked some people that presented it, didn't like some so much that presented it, yeah? And then I just entertained it. My mind entertained it. And lo and behold, things started to happen. Yeah? Instead of trying to get better as the problem, I saw the problem as a foreign installment. Yeah? As soon as I saw it as a foreign installment, the next idea that came into my field of possibilities, which wasn't appearing before this, was, hey, I can be free of it. If I'm not that, that leads immediately to the possibility I can be free from it. I was never led to that possibility because I was identified as that. The best thing I could try to do is be free as it, you know, maybe get therapy for it, maybe socialize it a little more so I don't make an ass of myself at the next dinner, maybe have just hope beyond hope, I'll have a three-month-long relationship that will work once. You know what I mean? I won't flip out at the next picnic. My idea of success was quite meager, you know? <laughs> but, but we all constrained because there was an identification as that. It's like if a big bug flew in here right now and landed on you, your initial reaction would be to knock it off. I bet you if it did it 30 times, your initial, like, before thought, you'd be like this, yeah? Well, this is sort of like a parasitical movement, yeah? But it comes, like alcoholism, but it's even prior to that. It's the original parasite, which is this addiction to self, you know? This parasitical movement lands on the host, yeah? It knows it's, and if you've ever been a host to being taken over by alcoholism or addiction or any kind of obsession, you know it's not very beneficial to the host, is it? <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, you know, <laughs> you're not going to like the, the vacation destinations. You're going to rehabs and you know prisons and county jails and court cases, a lot of that. So you would think that you'd want to throw it off. And this parasite knows that full well. But its strategy is a great strategy. Because in this example, it convinces the host that the host is the parasite. So now the host starts living as that, for that, by that, yeah? And in that process, it totally forgets its inherent nature, and it starts taking on the qualities that the parasite is presenting you to be, yeah? And now you're living from that takeover, where the only solution is prior to the takeover, yeah? And the only way to see is that it's an impossibility that you were ever taken over, yeah? It's impossible it could ever happen. It could only appear to happen, and only in time. It's not a timeless condition. It's only something that can appear. That's your way out. Yeah? Because most of us are starting, we were talking about it earlier, we wake up to life at, let's say, square three. We're the product of a mental process that takes time to produce. It's very, very fast, but it still takes time, and it's called selfing. And when selfing occurs, and when the product is complete, you feel like you were the one that was doing the selfing. Yeah. 
You don't see it screws with time. It's a product, and it takes time to produce, but the product it produces feels like it was prior to the production. Yeah? When you've been free of it, and then it suddenly appears, you have a historical feeling you were there prior as this. Yeah? It uses time to play with the illusion. So it's a product. It takes time to produce. When it's produced, you have a feeling like you were before the product. So isn't there a feeling that when something that doesn't seem to be happening, you're still happening? That's the sense of self. Did you say that again? When there's not anything happening, you you're still, you feel like you're still there while nothing's happening. That's the sense of self. That's being remembered. Mm. Yeah? But it has to constantly keep claiming what's going on, that it's going on to you to reinforce it. It's not something that will hold any water, so the bonding agent, the glue, has to be applied a lot of the time, all day. Voila, your narration in your head. Yes? The little narration you have going on, the little talking all day about what was happening, what is happening, what's going to be happening, how you are like, how you were like, how you will be like, how they are like, how they were, all that stuff. Yeah? That is the glue to reinforce the identification as a self. It needs tons of it because at any moment and all during the day, there's giant, giant free samples of that not being so. But it will forget it very quickly. Just like if a miracle happens at 10 in the morning, by 11.30 you've forgotten it. But a resentment of 35 years ago, you're still thinking about it as if it was yesterday. This is the bias of the conditional mind. Yeah, You're not going to win it over. You're not going to change it. You just got to recognize it's not you. Yeah. And then we're not giving you any replacement of what you are. Find out what you are by seeing what you're not. You'll find out what you are. It'll be constantly surprising, but you will find out. Yeah. All you see is, I'm not that, and then that's that. And then let's see what happens. If you're practicing shit, practice it, and it will illuminate that practice. If you have a path of life, if this is what you do, like work and surf or do this and that, it will illuminate that. It's not a path to illumination, but it will illuminate any path and every path that you're on. Because you're the bringer of the light. Yeah? And now that's out of the box, and it can then be put back in the box. Yeah? There'll be a knowing beyond knowing that this ain't true. That the inference... And the assumption and the insinuation won't trigger the habitual leap. It's just the feeling of being a self. It won't trigger it anymore. It will be a pause. And that's your original face, the pause. The space before the mental impression appears. That's what you really are. You are the first thing that's aware of conscious contact, which is the awareness of it. You're not the one who thinks he's aware of conscious contact. That's an afterthought. You are... No face. Yeah? You are no thing. It feels like if it's like a pause to everything else going on. That's what you are. You are that pause. Yeah? It may seem like it goes away very quickly, but actually that pause is not of time, so it's truly eternal. Even if it seems to have only taken a second and disappeared into the process, it hasn't gone anywhere. It's not of time. It's not a, a secondary pause. It's a pause. It put a brakes to the time. It puts the brakes to everything else. Yeah? And I would say that's what you and I are, is that pause. That's what it represents. You can rest there and abide there. You can have activity living from there without forgetting the resting and the abiding. You can pay all the dues you have to pay while in Rome, do as the Romans do, but you're not a Roman. <laughs> so put all the way all those togas and <laughs> just wear them loosely because you're not. A, see, the thing is, we're putting constant amount of uniforms on. There's just one uniform we call our skin, and that's the selfie. <laughs> it's just another uniform. You know what I mean? Like, you're a mother, you're a grandmother, you're a dancer, you're this, you're that. There's tons of uniforms. But there's one uniform we keep calling our skin, <laughs> which is the selfie. 
it can also be taken off <laughs> by realizing you never put it on. <laughs> oh, seriously, you'll travel a lot lighter with all the other uniforms on your life. You really will. You'll be able to wear a lot, di- a lot of different hats, yeah, because you're not rigidly into one. Because it's, it's just not the way it is. It's just like a seat assignment. You know, you have a certain calling. It doesn't mean the seat assignment you're in is going to have your name engraved in it, like stone. The music is going to go on. It's more like musical chairs, and everyone gets up, and then you're in a seat, and the music stops, and there's your seat assignment for that day. <laughs> some days I'm painting, some days I'm surfing, some days I'm doing a talk. It goes on and on. It goes different ways. Yeah. <laughs> you wear it loosely because you're not that, nor are you that. You're not that, period. <laughs> you are why you seeing all of that. You are the seeing of it. You're not a noun. Seeing does not turn into a seer. It's just seeing. Yeah? That's why we have difficulty seeing it, because we're looking for something. We're looking for a noun. We're looking for the doer of all doers, the, the alpha of all alphas. It's not like that. To me, it's just everything is moving. Everything is in motion. Mind is in motion. Everything is streaming. And there's no noun to be found in any of it. There's just the appearance of nouns, yes? And we're the one that gives that. We, we give a verb an appearance of being a noun. And it's sort of like putting a flag full in, in a river. Yeah? It's, sort of, it's like insane. I, you know, this is me, my river. And the water just keeps on rolling. You know, if you put something there, like a rock, it's amazing. You put a rock in running water, what happens? A certain amount of the water starts, a new current gets produced, yeah? And some of the water starts going around the rock. And what the water is carrying is a lot of different things that appear here. Let's call them leaves and twigs. And now the current is bringing those leaves and twigs around the rock. And the rock's gravitational pull is pulling this around. And now this stuff gets stuck on the rocks, the leaves and the twigs. And then there's almost like a stagnation occurs and there's a little eddy of water that's not moving anymore. Yeah? And then now its ability to reflect is gone because its, its surface is dull with all the shit on it. So you can't see infinity by looking at the water. Yeah? And then maybe the rock is bitching about all this, but it's basically the, the cause of it happening. Just remove the rock. The, it, water has no intention to go that way. It was just responding to the rock. When the rock is removed, the water is carrying all that stuff down, and now you can see, you can see reflections in it again and everything like that. Yeah. Let's say that's this idea of being a self, or that a, a noun, is that rock we're putting in this thing called life, and now we're seeing life is happening to us. And it doesn't make a lot of sense. And things that we don't want to happen seem to be coming. And things we want to happen seem to be going right by. Yeah? And then tons of opinions and ideas get speculated upon. And because we have this drive to feel secure about being right, we believe some insane shit. Yeah? And yet the irritability and restlessness and discontent is never getting tamed. You can see it by your incessant seeking. not your incessant seeking, it's seeking. But if the only solution to the dissatisfaction is satisfaction, I'm telling you. If you're content, you won't be looking for contentment. I'm telling you, right now, you'll be content with what you're looking at. You know, it's just the way it goes. <laughs> and then these qualities of mind, that you want to say, oh, that person brought me joy. No one's ever brought you joy. They were just a trigger for the joy that was available in you to be expressed. If you're up the ass of self, you're not going to be having too many joyful experiences, are you? I was never a grateful cocaine addict, you know. I wasn't giving people coke. Oh, here, have it all. And it's like so funny, addictions are so funny. No addiction ever is satiated, really. I never got a shot of coke where I realized, oh, that's the nirvana of coke, you know. I've reached cocaine satori. Thank you, Coke. I love you. I appreciate you. But I'm giving all my Coke away to everyone else. I never need to do any more Coke. I'm satiated, satisfied. It never happened. Why? Because it's not about Coke. It's about getting relief from the bondage of self. Yeah? And if the identification is self in place, you're going to be irritable Coke or no Coke. (laughs) You're going to be irritable, restless, and discontent. And like this... 
teaching we read earlier today said you can't use activity to find stillness. That would be activity. You can't use an agitated mind to try to seek peace. It will just agitate with the idea of peace. The idea of peace will stir up its agitation even more. Yeah? What's one to do? Let the system collapse. Start, look at the house of cards and start calling the spade a spade. And then one will be taken out and one, and you'll hit a critical mass and the house of cards will collapse. And you'll see you're still there. You'll see something ends and yet something continues. You're that which is continuing. Yeah? Self comes with stops and starts. The selfing. When you're doing something you really love, you're not remembering self, so its presence isn't felt here. You have a feeling of freedom, yet you usually uh, claim it to be the thing you were doing that did it to you. But in fact, it was your mind, yes? So self, many, many times during the day, is totally halted. Yeah? But there's not much noticing it. Yeah? It's... Too, the selfing is like mercury. You ever see when you break something and the mercury goes and it recover lumps? That's what's happening with selfing. You can have an epiphany, yeah? Which you ever had an epiphany? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did you make it? Did you know it was coming? Did you, you know, it's like I know it's Epiphany Wednesday. <laughs> Happy hour at Epiphany Wednesday. You don't want to have an epiphany for an hour or two. You don't make a reservation for any place and get the right music. You know? It just sort of intervenes unexpectedly into what you call life, yeah? And that, and what that is, is really the remembrance of self has been stopped, you're not remembering self, and then something is blooming, yeah? In that absence of self. What happens when it usually ends? It, it, you, the ending of an epiphany usually coincides with a thought like this, I'm having an epiphany. <laughs> as soon as the epiphany is claimed, it's not an epiphany anymore. It's your epiphany. <laughs> and then you bring it to your spiritual mantle and you put it up there like a like a big lion's head you got in this and your safari. Look at it, I was on this spiritual safari, I got this big epiphany. Just take it up there, call up the eight hundred number for epiphanies and hey uh, did you get any uh, notices of big epiphanies? I think I got the biggest one. I had this huge one, it lasted four hours. You know what I mean? <laughs> and then that epiphany is used to make every moment you're in after it not a enough. The mind claims it, and then the absence of self is used to promote the presence of self. It's freaking incredible. You can't win without losing. So how, what would be the best way to get out of something is to realize you're not in it. It takes no time whatsoever. None. It, it takes no time to get out of something you're not in. I'm telling you. <laughs> it's the only solution that works when you see the problem is imaginary what more do you need to do you don't need to apply a solution the solution only has relevance when the problem seems real when you really entertain the solution it will point out to you very clearly the problem is not real and there goes the solution also you don't need that. You're going to travel so light here. It's all about ec- ec- economizing and paring down. It's not adding on to. It's totally paring down. You get lighter and lighter. What you would call essential is seen as to be totally unessential. And what you were overlooking becomes the most profound value. The nothing of ordinary dead, dead dog shit awareness becomes all there is. What most seekers would just step over on their parade to find the truth is the daily just awareness of the conscious contact that we are. Yeah? You are aware of consciousness, aren't you? You can sense something seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting. You are aware of that. To honor that would change everything here. Your value system. You'd have immunity to thoughts because they wouldn't be yours. Your interest and attention may be curious, but after it went a little like two years down to what I'm gonna what could happen to me, you've lost interest after like three days. You know? You don't go anymore. The interest and attention goes and then on the back. And after a while, it doesn't even look when it goes, hey, come on! 
It just stays, rests right where you are right now. And it, therefore, it's enriching your life instead of stealing it in a way. It's like we all be one here as sons of faith, as a quality of mind. Yeah? It's not something to acquire at a church. You have it. The thing is, the faith will manifest here in what vehicle it is put in. If you have faith in a failed thought system, that faith is going to produce a huge amount of anxiety about what's not happening. That's where it's going to do its miracle work. It's going to produce effects in your experience right now for an imaginary field called what's not happening, the future. Yeah? Only through thought and concern about it. You're going to have a contraction now based on your belief you'll be contracted then when you get ill or you're destitute or you have cancer or your husband leaves you or your husband stays or whatever it is. Yeah? You're going to entertain that and your ability of mind, the faith of mind, will enliven those thoughts about that which is not happening and produce an effect in what's happening right now. You'll feel a contraction and your attention will be so absorbed in that you won't be able to respond to what's going on because you're totally a devotee to what's not going on. You can be in a beautiful situation and there'll be no response to it because you're not responding here. You're reacting to thoughts about next week or thoughts about last week. And they've c- captured your attention and interest that you have nothing to spend here. You can't even be present in a sense, yet you're never, you can never not be present. But you can appear not to be here because you're in there and then. It produces the physiological effects of fear, yet with no apparent threat right now. It's mental anxiety. It buzzes you out. You know how many... Have you ever had fear in your life? I was in surfing once, and there was a shock out. And man, the adrenaline drenched my body, I swam in. And I was just rushing for about 40 minutes to let the adrenaline soak up, you know? Because it was just t- fight or flight. The mental anxiety is producing similar things to that on lesser scales all day about what's not happening. It's like you're getting electrocuted by your own thoughts. They're buzzing you. And it's not the thought. The thought is the prod, but the electrical shock is the belief. Yeah, It's the faith. The prod just carries the shock. The shock. But the shock isn't from the prod. It's enlivened by your belief. You're a devotee to that thought system. And your faith in it produces anxiety. That same faith, if we put in a different vehicle, which I find is not in that system, in a system called centeredness, not self-centeredness, that faith produces an ease and comfort now. It's the same faith, exact same energy, but what vehicle is it put in? Yeah? How could what's not happening produce an effect in what's happening, unless there's a mind that's per- is performing a miracle, basically. It's it's resurrecting something that never was and producing an effect as if it will be. All day? All day? Reacting all day to not today? What kind of Petri dish in mind and emotions is that going to produce? You'll have no anchor. You'll never even be able to recognize what's really going on. You'll be at the whim of a crazy mind telling you this and that about this and that all day. And every time it spooks you, you'll jerk up. Every time it pulls its little thing, you'll be, you know what I mean, like a sadistic, uh, like a sadistic dog walker. You know, just pulling the back. <laughs> you know, you thought you, were, you spent all this money to go on this retreat. <laughs> You're not going to be present at all. <laughs> you know, you have vacation to Hawaii, you're thinking about work. You're at work, you're thinking about Hawaii. <laughs> they never seem to compliment the re- actually what's going on. You want to be there when you're working, but when you get to the vacation, you want you're at work. Jesus Christ. There is a solution. Look, see, you have the ability to recognize. 
You have that quality of mind. Yeah. If I'm not that, all the point in the world can ever make it so. Yeah? The pointing will be there, there'll be a pause, and there's no shock. No no juice to make it seem to be so. It gets freaking transmitted, transformed into something else. Let's say peace and clarity. Yeah? And after a while, the habit breaks and less and less of it even attempts to bridge. It never even attempts. So you just see the pointing, it's getting more and more feeble, you know? It's more and more archaic, it's old. So, but, uh, yeah, you had to do it. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, it's you, you did it. You shouldn't have done it on this, you know, and that. And it, it has, you can't even, when it sings its siren song, you never even look back. Because you've realized it's a foreign song. And it really has nothing to do with you whatsoever. It's like a voice box. You know, I used to, I used to work at a sex shop, you know. Called the Pink Pussycat Boutique, <laughs> Fort Lauderdale. There's one in New York City. There's three branches. You had to be an S graduate to work there. That's oh, the only thing geez. I had going with me. I was from S in the seventies, so I got a job at this place. I'm a Catholic kid from Long Island. I was about eighteen. Go to Florida. No, I was about. I was twenty something. Then. Yeah, twenty three. I got there. So I was working there in. Um, I, I, I got to sell a lot of things, you know, which I thought I'd never sell. You know, just, I would just get over it. But then they had these blow-up dolls with three orifices. Who the hell knows what people do? They always say they were going to use it for a bachelor party, but I was suspiciously thinking this was their date for the night. You know, I was like, so weird. But I'd get over it and sell it. But then they came out with a new version that had a voice box on it. So when you pulled it, a cord, it would say, I'm a real girl. I love you, I love you, I love you. And I just couldn't sell it. I, mean, I, said, I can't do this. Because I look at the guy and I said, you're not seriously going to be home with this. So I, I, I just can't sell it. I just can't do it. I, just, I couldn't get over that. But that's sort of like the, the, the selfing. It's just like a voice box. It's part and parcel of the brain and the body. It's going to end when this ends. It's not going to fly away and attach to another living throat. Yeah? It isn't. It doesn't have any life but yours. And when your life ends, it ends. And it's going to be talking maybe to you, as you, until the moment of death. And if it has been, and you've been listening to it devotedly, you've been living a time delay. Every moment it talks about is a previous moment. Because it took a while for the selfing to arrive. Yeah, it's a mental process that has to be produced. Yeah, so the, the the moment it's talking about is a past moment. So let's say you're living your life and you're always living on this time delay, and you get to the near the end of your life and you pass away. Your body passes away, and at the moment of passing away, you were all for all intents and purposes not there because you were waiting to hear the mind tell you what happened. And there isn't going to be any mind saying another fucking word because it died with the body. Yeah? Could you imagine that? All this whole life, a birth you can't remember, and then a death that you weren't uh, uh, you weren't available to. What a wild event! But some Buddhism is all about the moment of death. That's what they're trying to train themselves to be conscious at. Can you imagine living off of that time delay? And you work 30 years to be in the moment of that. And then, see, for me, I've had traumatic situations. You are not there as a self when something happens traumatically. Yeah. I mean, I felt that I, I hit the bottom when I was surfing once, and my nervous system shut off. Because I had had a concussion earlier surfing in another place, and it hit my head perfectly, and my nervous system shut off, like the computer shut off. First, my arms and my legs went out, and my body doesn't really move much, so everything was shut down. And luckily, I landed on my back. And I, you know, no matter how much I meditated, I wouldn't have known that was happening. Yeah, the awareness was there, but never. You're never gonna be able to sync the narrator with the the contemporary events. It can't be done because it takes time for the narrator to appear. Yeah. So this whole idea of prepping yourself for the moment of death, I don't see the point of it. Because the times I've died, that thing I was identified with was nowhere to be found. What was there was bright light. 
yeah, which is, I believe, what we are in this this pause. But what I thought I was didn't show up. Who's a Johnny come lately? It showed up when I was in the hospital and bitched about why I did what I did. <laughs> and you know, you did it again. And it just went on and on and on. You know? <laughs> it was unbelievable. But the times I died in this life, it was not there. So I wouldn't be relying on that. You, you may miss the big show, baby. <laughs> the show's now. <laughs> I know it doesn't look like much. I'm in front of you, but this is the show. <laughs> it is what's happening. That one quality you can't deny. I mean, ultimately, you can say you deny it, but not as a as, a, as what's happening now. So, yeah. Any questions tonight? I think everyone deserves another 25 minutes, right? At least, mm-hmm. yeah. So. You know, I have trouble with these. I'm not having it today, but the, doing a lot of talks because I truly believe this is why I, this was a bad choice as a cottage industry for me. Because <laughs> I can't stretch this event out. I can't have meditation as filler, or you know what I mean. Let's do some tantric work or something. It doesn't. It doesn't. That's, well, that can be done, but I can't, I couldn't fit it under this umbrella. It wouldn't work for me. So it just well, doesn't ring. It's a message, yeah. It's not a dissertation. It's a simple message. It's like a spiritual subpoena. You've been served, really. You know, I've done my job. I'm like a mailman. I delivered something. I don't want you to follow me home. <laughs> You're not going to find any interest in there. Just here's the message. And I wouldn't share it unless I believed it was available right now. Just as you are. Because I know just as you are isn't you. Yeah. And I know what is you is always you. And that's what this message is for. It has to go through a conceptual mail slot. We use language, but that's just the writing on the envelope. When the conditional mind opens up the envelope, it'll see nothing, and that's the message. Mm-hmm. And it'll leave all these messages strewn, but the raw mind will pick up the message, the real message. That's the aha. Yeah. It looks in it, there's nothing there, and then it gets it's everything. You finally get that you're everything by receiving nothing finally. How many somethings have you got? You know, and when you add them all up, they usually add up to nothing, right? Why not start with nothing? Save yourself a lot of time. Seriously, put it to the test. Entertain it. Yeah. When you have an urge to throw another log on the fire, don't let the fire just burn. As it is. You know, maybe not read another book so quickly. Not go to another. You know, someone else. It's not more here. Yeah? It can be the slightest little suggestion and it can trigger the whole event. Yeah? It's not more. It's not quantity. It's when your mind is ready, it will hear. Repetition is helpful because it's like the mind's like a lazy Susan. It's like you, They look like there's a lot of entries, but maybe only one goes really in. So as it's spinning... If you hit it the right day, it gets all the way in there, like an unspoken yes, and then the game is on, yeah? yeah? Then it's about relegated into I don't know, and then you find out. You find out what it means to you. And that way it has some breath and weight, yeah? Some substance, because it's very, very freaking intimate. And then you just, the thing is, the mind has a quality of entertaining, and it will never be unenthused by this. Because this is, the mind meets its match. This is constantly so. Yeah? You know, like when you were a kid, when you were babies in this room, let's say a baby came in and you went, ah, and the baby would, ah. You could do it 30 times, the same reaction would happen. Or a Labrador at the beach, you throw it once, the ball, or 800 times, the wet tail's wagging just like it was the first time. But us, we see, oh, I've seen that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, this is what happens. Your, your mind gets brought back to that unconditional rawness. So wonder and awe, curiosity, yes? Inquisitiveness, stop getting fired. And you meet your match with this because it's always available at all times, right where you are, with no requirement necessary. None whatsoever. Paul, can you speak to this thinking about 
victimhood versus agency. Well, how we will experience, even hearing you talk somehow as we're passively hearing, and it can resonate for the sense of, I'm not quite sure how to do that. So I'm just thinking, how, how just if you could speak to that sense of... Well, stay and not, you're not quite sure how to do it, because you're not going to do it. Stay there. Let the doing crumble up. Let the doing dry up. Let the formatted, all right, I'm going to do, in my have, do and have myself into a state of being. You can only do and have yourself into a, a mental state. The state of being is already complete. You can't do and have yourself into it. Yeah. It's complete. It's already complete. It's not, in, it's not in time because it's not doing any process to find completion or evolve or anything. It's basically what it's doing here is expressing. It's not here to achieve anything. It's expressing. So that being has nothing to do with doing. Yeah? But, but you talk about entertaining it. Entertaining is quite different. It's like the mind looking out of an open door, seeing what comes in and seeing the... the like when I'm sitting here, I'm looking at the space of this room. I look outside, I can see the almost, almost palpably the space. Yeah? You're seeing, it's not like this. You're basically like gazing very, very effortlessly and you sense a space. Yeah? You sense it. It's like a tactile feeling after a while. So that's what I call entertaining. So an idea gets introduced to me. I don't rush home and throw 800 more coals on the fire. I let that one simmer and see how it cooks. Walk around, and if I'm led to check something else out, I do. And I just entertain what I heard. A lot of times, something that's said or, or read stops you, stops the conditional mind, and then the raw mind is available. Yeah, the unconditional mind. That, those are great pauses. When I would read some of these people, and they would say things like, "You can't use the Buddha to seek the Buddha." That stopped my thought system. Put it in its tracks. When that stopped, the pause was relevant. It was there. So, I like that. It was sort of like the whole thing. It didn't change anything in the room, but the whole room dropped down like 10 feet. Everything looked exactly the same, but it was a whole different feeling. Like a relaxation you couldn't get by 50 Thai massages. You had a different type of relaxation. The really letting go of the ghost of selfing, you know? That fucking lead ball, that contraction, that root contraction got loosened up. So why not explore and entertain? Yeah. And I had enough of trying to figure it out by doing and studying and reciting. Yeah. And I find that I wasn't the one that was failing in all that. That's a failed system. It doesn't work with this topic. You can't do and have and study yourself into it. It's more of being undone. Yeah. Being pared down. So for me, it was I could boil it down to I was... I'm constantly seeing what I'm not. So I would say, I am the seeing of what I'm not. Yeah? And that's that. I don't know what I am, and I don't care about what I am. But I'm, I'm very clear about what I'm not. Yeah? And I'm not a long-lasting, independent, separate entity with historical data. <laughs> you know? I'm not the doer. I'm not the thinker. I'm not the feeler. I'm not the hearer. It's quite obvious that there's hearing, feeling, thinking going on, but there's not a hearer, a thinker, or a feeler. Yeah. And the freedom is from that pseudo nounness, from being the one. Yeah. From being the thing. Yeah. Um, I have a question about how does that show up in relationships with your life? Like with anything? Well, it'll be hard because it's it's moment to moment. It's hard to say, how does this show up? It shows up all day, <laughs> in some way. Eliminate relationships? What? Does it, like, eliminate relationships? Because eliminate? No, no. I think it's the only way I can be in a relationship. Because I'm not in one. It's the only way it works for me. If I was in a relationship, there'd be a reason to be out of it. But the relationship I'm in, I'm not in it, so it keeps on going. It's great. <laughs> Seriously. It's the longest relationship I've ever had, three and a half years, because I haven't been in it. <laughs> if I was in it, I would have been out long ago. I guarantee it, because that was my track record. Just the same thing, like, I'm accountable for events in my life, so I'm much more able to respond than when I thought I was responsible. 
what I thought I was responsible was about avoiding all the responsibility. Now I'm accountable. I can show up and say, hey, listen, I, I did this and da da da, because I didn't do it really. But in Rome, you do as the Romans do, so I make amends pretty quickly. Yeah, to keep everything clean. Before, I would avoid that person who would move out of the country. <laughs> Just to avoid the confrontation of having to tell them, you know, I'm not perfect. Yeah. yeah. So it's weird. You would think one thing. Just like you'll be more of an expression of indiv- individualism when you're not an individual than when you're trying to be one. Yeah? You'll, your quirkiness will be amplified unbelievably, without trying to amplify it, yeah? Because you'll see, you won't have a rigid idea of who you are, you basically show up as whatever happens, yeah? You know? If I shot some coke right now, I, I probably would pass the basket immediately, grab the donations, and probably steal your bike, maybe. You never have some time yeah. I could. Who knows? All the bets would be off. Because nothing is, nothing is is in concrete, yeah? It's all the different Petri dishes that your mind's wrestling in. If I introduce drugs, the amount of historical conditional data in that fucking cloud up there would trigger a lot of downloads. You're the junkie again, Paul. Who knows what would happen? I'd probably be the first junkie (laughs) non-dualist. Junkie non-dual teacher. An active junkie teaching (laughs) non-duality. I don't think that would last long. <laughs> because you can't teach non-duality. Non-duality is a negation, remember. It's a negation. It's not an affirmation. It just negates. It negates the idea of duality as being what's so. Yeah? It's all it does. It doesn't say, okay, that's not so, and this is so. It doesn't say non-duality is so. It just negates duality. You throw non-duality out also. The only thing you can teach or inform anyone about is is duality. You can't inform anyone about non-duality. Yeah? You are the non-duality. You are that quote-unquote oneness. I I don't like the word oneness anyway. Let's say you are that. But you can teach about what you're not, for sure. So that you can point out to a mind you may not be that. So it can entertain and get free from that bondage of that imaginary self. Yeah. And live life. Yeah. That was great, by the way. Thank you. It was still is. Yeah. It's, still funny. <laughs> it's not over yet, bro. <laughs> <laughs> We're going. Do you ever uh, do you ever find yourself selfing? Do you ever drift into selfing and catch yourself or that I never that find myself happen? selfing, but there's selfing. There's no self to self. There's no self that's doing selfing. There's just selfing. And I see it. It's selfing still. That's what the mental process does. But there's no self that's doing it. You see? The the feeling of being the one that was doing it would be the product of selfing. Mm -hmm. Yeah? That's what it does. The selfing, if followed through and the mind makes the leap, you feel like you're either being done to by the selfing or you're doing the selfing. That's the selfing. There isn't a self that's doing it. That's the product of selfing. Yeah? You see? Yeah. Make sure you see the product. The product is only an activity. It assumes that there's a someone, and that, and then the mind makes the leap. That's why there's a solution right where you are. Because if your mind doesn't make the leap, it doesn't become seemingly so. The sense of self. It needs you to make that appear to be true. It does. And without you, it's just yapping. Without you listening to it. There's a difference between hearing it and listening. I'm hearing the selfing. It's not like it, anything like it was. Because what happened with me, before everything was taken seriously, and now it's just, uh, it's like material for comedy skits. Seriously. It's just a giant comedy central all day. I'm just totally amused at how insane this thing is. <laughs> it really is. It's incredible. But before I took it seriously, man, I want a freaking book. It just drove me to try to get out of it, as it, which was hell. If you could transcend something, you can't transcend an imaginary place. Where you think you're at isn't what's actually happening. It's an imaginative, it's an imaginative place the mind's cooking up, yeah? If that becomes the here, and that's what I was as an addict, I wanted to get out of here, 
at all costs, but the here I wanted to get out of was a mental here. It wasn't even the here I was in. The here I was in was my solution. And that was the last place the problem wanted to look. It wanted me to be unconscious no matter what, because all that guilt and shame would catch up with me if I was conscious. So I just kept saying, it, to me, it was an occupation. It wasn't partying or anything. It was a job I had to do. I had to stay unconscious. Mm-hmm. Or super loaded. I liked cocaine because I thought, my crazy idea was, I felt felt like if I pulled my mind taut enough, it would snap and I'd be free of it. I figured if I could stay up 10 days, wired up, get enter a state of delirium, which you would, in that delirium, somehow there would be a mystical transcendence. Well, I was proven terribly wrong. <laughs> because you can't transcend an imaginary place. I was missing that. <laughs> Which continued to jackpot me in spiritual seeking and everything else. Yeah. But sometimes when, I, when I'm looking into what feels like a solid sense of self, like there's a powerful judgment going on of some kind, or or uh, I'm caught in being this, I'm this shameful, horrible person, or whatever it might be, uh, if I if I really look into that, there starts to be this intense kind of energy, like emotional energy, that comes through me, and it seems like that, you know, that identification with the thought is kind of trying to freeze and control that emotional energy, and when that's when that just kind of flows through, then something's different. Something's there's not the same sense of like the mind kind of relaxes, and I'm just kind of watching it more or something. Or, yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious about that, if like the sense of self is often this kind of way of, of uh, contracting around you know, emotional energy that doesn't want to be released. Or the, the well, in a way, it tries to have the emotional energy co- contract around it. Yeah. So the sense of self is initially a thought wrapped with feeling. Mm-hmm. So the emotional energy is its convincer. Yeah? The thought would be easily seen. But when you feel, see, it's a sense of self. It's not a thought of self that gets you. It's a sense. It's a feeling. Yeah. So the emotional, the emotional aspects, the selfing would like to keep that as a like a wrap around. Yeah. While the emotion, the emotional energy may want to express and expand, the selfing wants it to contract around it. Yeah. So when you have a, something opens up, your en- the energy immediately wants to expand. Yeah, and yet that's the the self wants to contract it, the self, because that's what covers the selfing as a bare thought is the feeling. So it's a vague feeling of being something. It's not a thought of self, and it's not an ego. It's a sense of self. It's the feeling of having an ego or not having an ego. Both of them are the sense of self. That's the real bonding point, not an ego. I don't believe. I don't see it that way. So yeah, a lot of times. Uh, A lot of times when there's a break, the amount of energy that's, it's almost like a nuclear reactor goes off. Yeah. Yes, that's what happens a lot because it's been contracted and then it's just, if you take energy and you contract it, it's naturally going to want to expand. That's what they, how they make explosions, yeah? They, the the atom condenses and then they split it or whatever and it blows up, a huge amount of juice comes out. Mind and this is so much far surpassing that. Energetic, yeah. Paul, yeah. There's one little piece that nags at me, and I don't understand uh, about conscious contact. You were saying that if it's not the eyes that see, but it's conscious con- consciousness, yeah, consciousness that yes, sees. Yes. Now, if I'm thinking to myself, okay, if my eyes are not, if I if I'm blind, does consciousness see? It doesn't no, then it's going through the other gates. So it's hearing. And it's not consciousness isn't seeing. Consciousness is appearing as seeing. It's just consciousness. But when it goes through the different gates, it sort of has a different experience of itself. So there's hearing, feeling, seeing, tasting, touching, yeah? But all it is is consciousness, yeah? Yeah. So what happens when if blind people, in a way, their other senses get more acute usually. So now consciousness is prohibited to go through that one gate and it goes through the other gates, maybe a little even more. So they get more attuned, they can sense things and stuff like that, yeah? Mm-hmm. Have you noticed that when you read a lot about blindness? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But consciousness isn't seeing, it's just consciousness. Mm-hmm. And it's appearing as seeing. Yeah? Mm-hmm. I've noticed that 
but it's just consciousness. Yeah? You're not hearing consciousness in a way. Consciousness is, as, is appearing as hearing. Yeah? And it's, and it's also the hearer and the heard, in a sense. So the whole event is, there seems to be a hearer, there's the hearing, and there's the heard. In the mental process, these are only emphasized. In the conscious, in the awakeness of conscious contact, all of that's emphasized. It's all one event called seeing. There would be no seeing without a seer and a scene here. Yeah, it's just one event. It's a seamless event. The mind wants to make it a noun, a verb, and another noun. But in fact, there's just seeing. There's just hearing. There's just feeling that contain. The, the aspect of hear and heard, because that's the event here. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But all there is is consciousness. Consciousness being conscious of itself as seeing, as hearing, as feeling, as tasting, as touching. It could have 30 gates. There's probably other beings in other places that have 30 gates of conscious contact, where they're seeing, hearing, feeling, and they have 25 other ones. It's not like the consciousness is limited by five gates. If there was 50 gates, there'd be 50 gates. So there'd be 50 experiences of consciousness. If there was 100, there'd be 100. Just like on this planet. One time there was only how many people on this planet, supposedly? Maybe a couple million, and now there's 13 billion? Has consciousness run out? Oh, we've got no more apparatuses. We don't have enough consciousness anymore. We've hit our limit, 13 billion. No, there could be 80 billion on this planet. If the planet could handle it, consciousness would be flowing through 80 billion capital locations. If it was 200 billion, 200 billion. Consciousness isn't a quantity. It's an infinite resource, yeah? So it doesn't matter how many there would be, it would still be conscious contact through the gates that were available. Do you think it would have run out? Do you think like, there's going to be, oh, we ran out of consciousness here on planet Earth. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Let's kill a few people, let's get some back, and only the elite get the consciousness, and all the trolls get the, just keep them unconscious to our super consciousness. No, consciousness is just like a, a field of infinite whatever. Yeah, yeah. happening here. Manifesting. That's how I see it. I mean, I can't see it running out. <laughs> just like your interest attention doesn't run out. It just leaves things. You don't lose anything. You, the, the thing doesn't grab your attention and run away with it. As soon as you get tired of it, the attention just goes back. Yeah. If you let your attention go, for me, it's like, what happened with me in alcoholism? I did recovery. I'm still doing recovery. Love the program, have total respect for what it's doing for a lot of people here. And you know what? I reached a point where I became like a free range alcoholic. Yeah? I enjoy, I, I honor the coop, but I don't have to go to the coop anymore. Yeah? But I honor the coop. I think the steps are great, but I think everything is about freedom from tools. Yeah? I think a tool, if it does a really good job, will provide its own point of obsoleteness. Yeah? I feel that, just like this. My job here is going to be to become obsolete for you. I'm just here to carry a message. Yeah? You're going to get the message, then my whole purpose, in a sense, is gone. Maybe you'll want to join together and hang out, but in a sense, this is a very bad career choice, if I haven't chosen, because I'm meant to become obsolete. My success is this, if you don't come back. <laughs> it's truly. I swear to God. Ultimately, if you don't come back, that's really successful. Now you're traveling light up. And yet there's no need for anything. You might be where exactly where you're at. You don't have to come to Lincoln Mass to hear it. You'll be hearing it in your own life. Yeah. Maybe you'll want to come and enjoy the space. It's very nice because it's lovely to share it. But there won't be that need there. Yeah. So I feel every tool has its value, but there's, it's really cool when you know when to put it down. Yeah. If you keep using a tool when you don't need to, it becomes a disservice. So things are here to maybe indicate a point to you in a certain direction. They cannot provide the direction. You're going to be the direction finder. Yeah. They can just indicate certain things, and they're great. They're, they have value for that, but... Everything, if I need to carry one extra thing, it's too much. I find it's really totally about 
economization, paring down, getting stripped down, just traveling lighter. In the old days, I may have had to brought eight books. Now I'm a shirt salesman. All I did was stuff my carry-on with shirts. The only book I bought was some lousy thing about Bangkok. I'm not reading the sutras or the scriptures. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> you are the living scripture. Yeah. Every day today is, a, is an empty page you're writing right now. This is the holiest of holies right at this moment. Seriously. Right, and we're on sacred ground. You don't need to temp- build a temple there. This is sacred ground. The space we're in right now is sacred. Why? Because you're here. That's what makes it sacred. Like they say in physics, the biggest influence of any experiment is the observer of it. The biggest influence of ever, any life is the liver of it. You you play a huge role here. Through this apparatus, all the meaning of everything that you come in contact with is being given. Yeah. That's a powerful role. This isn't about victimhood or being imposed upon. This is, in a way, I don't like those those seminars about empowerment, whatever, but this is the most empowering message you could ever hear. Blame will just shrink up. You won't see anyone ever did anything contrary to them what was supposed to happen. Yeah? You'll be let off the hook. They'll be let off the hook. Yeah? When the biggest hook you're on is the one you've got yourself on. There's that one thing you feel you did that can never be forgiven. Isn't there? Just one. Just one, yes. (laughs) (laughs) The one secret. And this woman lady wanted me to talk about guilt, cause of miracles, right? This is just my take on it. It may not be how they do it, but this is how I see it. In the Course of Miracles, they talk about guilt. That, and the guilt they talk about is sort of like, uh, let's just, I'll use an example. When I was young, I was six years old, and I had a father and a mother. I lived in suburbia, New York. Everything was fine, and my father got really ill. So he wasn't going to be able to play with me anymore, you know, outside, like throw the ball and like that. And he wasn't going to be able to take me to Little League practices down the road. And my family tried to tell me about that. My mother and our doctor, Jan Quinto, came and he told me about it. It's your father, he's really ill, he's not going to be able to play with you. And I heard everyone say what they said, but in my, in my conditioning, I said, what did I do wrong to make my father not want to play with me? That's how it was translated. No matter what they said, it was taken to be self-centered. You know, I had something to do with him not wanting to play with me. This is like guilt to me, yeah? In the Course of Miracles, they say, all right, inside everybody, you have ideas of, let's say, unity and perfection and what you would call heaven and love and eternal happiness. Yet, your daily experience doesn't seem to sort of echo that as being what's so, Yes? And you see that, you have that idea, then you see what's actually happening, and somehow you're written into it as being the cause of the separation from God. Yeah. That's what the guilt in Course of Miracles is. You believe that you separated from God, which is an impossibility, but you're believing that, and there's a huge guilt about that. Yeah? And basically you're trying you made this world to try to throw it off of yourself. So that's what's happening quite a lot. Yeah? But it could never have happened. There's never been a separation. There's only an appearance of separation. It can never reach the level of truly being so. It can only appear to be so to you. The you is very important. Not what you are, but the you. The AU that you're not. Yeah? There's an AU that's being presented, a selfing that you're not. That's what allows that to appear to be true. Yeah? If you're not that, the appearance to be true will wane and you'll see it for what it is and you'll be let off your fucking hook. You'll be let off all the hooks. Yeah? Yeah. And that's what the Course of Miracles says. It's not about forgiveness. It's truly atonement where you get to a point where you see that nothing ever really happened. No one ever really did anything to me and I truly never really did anything to anyone else. That's the freedom doesn't mean you're irresponsible. I'm actually more accountable by realizing I wasn't responsible for what happened in my life. I've become much more accountable for what happened in my life to other people. 
Yeah, I've made my amends and stuff. When I was responsible, that's what I was trying to avoid was making those amends. When, when I realized I would have done it to anyone unless you could have physically stopped me. When I was loaded, there was I was powerless over what was going to happen. And the only way you could stop me was physically. The police or you physically stopped me. Nothing else. No talking to me. No trying to get to my best side. I was a ravenous addict. I wanted. I needed to get what I wanted. Yeah. I did not see myself at fault in any of that. I was totally powerless. I get the definition of powerlessness, which is like you're dancing with a gorilla, and you're going to stop when the gorilla wants to stop. You basically have no say in that, and you don't. Well, you're powerless quite a lot here. A lot of different mental winds are taking you over. They are. And they're using you for expression. Let's say there's mental winds that can't take form, but they can take an expression through form. And they're using us to express themselves. So let's say the big ones like greed, envy, and malice. Yeah. In a sense, no one is a greedy person, but they're representing greed, let's say. In their mental, in the mental winds that are blowing through them are that quality. Greed, let's say malice, envy, yes, enemy, threats, all like that, paranoia. Yeah? They're just mental winds that are occupying that possibility, yeah? based on the petri dish of the mind. If you see that, let's say the petri dish of the mind to easily be taken over is the self. Because whatever is taking you over, you'll claim to be your expression. So you'll be calling it your greed, your malice. Yeah. So you'll never see the root of the malice. You'll never see the root of the greed because you'll disguise it in yours. The identification as. Yeah. So you'll be a greedy person. You'll be a hateful person. And yet the true root of the hate is not of a person. It's a mental wind. Yeah. That's what happens. What alcoholism does. You're identif- you're not, you don't realize that you're identified with the projection of alcoholism as you. And now it's expressing through you in, your, in this life. And every expression it's doing, you're calling yours. So it's pr- expressing the paranoia that produces resentments, you're calling them my resentments. You're, you're in a state of fear, tons of anxiety, you're calling every bit of that fear and all the anxiety yours. You can't separate the two because you're identified as the source. You're identified as the source of the expression, therefore you claim the expression as the source. It's called the bondage of self. It's not, it's not bondage to self. Like Self is not a chair that you're handcuffed to. If you were, then you could get a spiritual locksmith who could find the right key and loosen you. It's called bondage of self. It's an activity. It's a mental activity that's possibly going on, and it can possibly not be going on. It's up to the mind, in a sense. But it's possibly going on, and it's attempting to bond the mind to the idea of being a self. There's nothing right and wrong with it. That's just what it's doing. Yeah? Maybe it finds security in that. Maybe it finds like an organizing principle. If it's all happening to me, I can make sense of all that's happening. Who knows? But it's trying its best, but it's pretty damn freaking distorted. Yeah? So that's what's going on. With that expression of self being taken over by, the, all these other mental winds can easily come through you and be disguised by your expressing them as yours. Fuck. How will you ever get to the root of it as a foreign installment if you keep calling the foreign installments effects yours? Jesus Christ, that's the act of being bonded to the idea of being a self or to an other or to a foreign installment. The real freedom is seeing you're not that. And then the holes those winds are blowing through get blocked up. You start having an immunity to it. And then something that's benevolent moves through you. Quite benevolent. Something that's very, very large and clear moves through you. And you start intimating that. And you start expressing those effects in your character and personality. And so the junkie becomes an unjunkie. Because it was never a junkie. And it's not the unjunkie either. It's just an expression. What's ever dominating this opportunity and this time is what's expressing through it. Yeah? There is no one at home. It's just an in. It's an in moving things, moving in and out. There is no there's no tenant. There's no noun. It's just verbing. Yeah? 
verbing seeking expression. And a lot of it's seeking expression is through us. So, if this opens up to you, there's plenty of grace, honor it. Open up to it, entertain it, and see what it's like to be taken over by this instead of being taken over by alcoholism or envy or any whatever it is, ambition or whatever. Constant, there's a lot of winds that can take oneself over or one's non-self. But if you get taken over by this, you may like the occupation. You, know? you may thrive under it. I find it to be very, very relieving. Yeah. Yeah. And all you need to do, it's no effort, you just entertain it. Why not? Your mind will enter. If you got, let's say you're in selfing and your legs are too short, you know, like your, your jeans, you can entertain hours about that. Right? Your mind entertains. <laughs> it's not there, all right. Your mind entertains. Yeah? Now you probably go home, see? I just put the thought in there. But the mind will entertain. Why not let it entertain some other possibilities like peace, you know, like okayness, like well being? Don't go riff on that too. Yeah? Give it some new notes to play. <laughs> some new sheet music. Not I Me My. <laughs> I mean, you know, you hear that George Harrison song? I Me My, I Me My, I Me My. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> no, you're not. No, you're not. No, you're not. <laughs> That's that. Have a giant pause. That's that. That'd be a cool song. <laughs> hey, uh, that's it. Eh? Right? Oh, you want more? I have some more tricks I can perform. Yeah. Karaoke.